Hey everybody, how's it going? Welcome along to 90 Min. What a show on the way with Scott Saunders, Harry Seaman, myself, Jacob Colshaw and Kwaku. Afari Kwaku, it's so good to have you back, mate. Um, we just said we every time we get a new guest on, we're like, we have levelled up and the last time we saw you was in... Yeah, brick, yeah. brick lane, yeah. like brick back to yeah, bricks man. everywhere. I can actually see you guys. So yeah, no, it's the proper. Are <laughs> you looking proper... HD? Yeah, I'm mate. Yeah, I know, I know. Okay. <laughs> How are you, mate? You okay? I'm good, man. I'm good. It's been a great week of football um, as a Chelsea fan. <laughs> so yeah, I've been. Everyone I've been lost it. around you, right? Everyone, and then you had yeah, the Europe th ex stuff on top. Yeah, man, it's been a great week of football. So I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting excited to talk about. Even it. after Monday, where you smash Everton and people are talking yeah. about the penalty. Oh, man, that, that was disappointing. That was definitely disappointing. I've got a vendetta against Nicholas Jackson, but we moved. <laughs> <laughs> Harry, we have to kind of get the elephant out of the room. How are you? Are you okay? Is it, it's been, I have to admit, Harry, genuinely as a mate, um, like I class you as one of my very good mates. I am actually feeling for you right now because it's been a very rough week. And yeah. I don't mean, that's not sarcastic at all. Why are you smiling? <laughs> <laughs> well, how are you going? He's always smiling. Yeah, yeah. How, how are you, mate? Did, was it a sleepless night? Uh, no, it wasn't a sleepless night. It was more... You know, like sometimes when you lose a big game, there's mm. anger. There's no anger. It's just you disappointment. Sure? Yeah, there is. A, there is. A, you sound like I Scott. I, 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 I got the brunt of that anger, didn't I? Like yeah. You posted a stupid tweet. You deserved it. Arsenal posted a stupid tweet. For we'll, a bit we'll get into that. <laughs> do, you <know> what? <laughs> do you know what? For a bit of context, and if you don't follow Scott and Harry, make sure you do. They had a little bit of a to and fro last night. I mean, Harry's someone who doesn't really nibble at many tweets, but I think Scott was probably the exception where you thought, you know what, I'm going to have to have a little nibble. I saw back. it. I saw it last night. I was like, ooh. <laughs> 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 Big quake, you were just sitting back getting the popcorn out. Uh, Scott, how are you, bud? Everything is right with football today. Is that one of the best is nights right with in your season? Well, United have fallen so far that, yes, I have to take pleasure in other clubs failing currently until we get it right. Which, I don't know how long that'll take. Big show on the way. Big show. We're going to start with the uh, Champions League action last night. We're actually going to start the Etihad as well. Um, we will get a big section on Arsenal in just a moment. So make sure you do leave a like, subscribe to 90 Min, turn on your post notifications, follow Quake and myself, Harry and Scott on our social channels. Man City 1, technically Real Madrid 2. I know it was on penalties. 5-4 um, technically on aggregate as well. Uh, Scott, we predicted, I think I predicted one of the games like yesterday to go all the way. Probably expected the Bayern game to go all the way, so I was a little bit surprised this one did. But I guess the main takeaway is you can never write off Real Madrid in the Champions League. Football heritage, a great man once said. <laughs> <laughs> and Real Madrid are football heritage, don't they? Um, you know, I, there's a lot of fallout. I'm sure we get in, we'll get into what Rodri said. Uh, I definitely want to talk about that at some point. But maybe a general overview of the game. You know, I think it's really, really difficult to maintain a level of football and desire. When you win a treble... It's really difficult to do it again. When you win a trophy, it's really difficult to do it again. I know City have won three in a row in the league, possibly four this season. But retaining the Champions League, there's a reason why teams don't do it. Uh, and when you come up against Real Madrid, I know they've regenerated their team. Some of the old heads who have uh, who've won multiple Champions Leagues are now starting to play bit pot roles or have left. But, you know, they just hang in there, don't they? They've just got this thing about them, Real Madrid. Like kings of Europe for a reason. There's the, the word aura. Um, yeah. We will touch on those Rodri comments in just a moment. Kwaku, uh, were you surprised the fact Real Madrid went through on penalties? Was that what did you predict going into it? First off, I thought City would go through. Right, okay. I thought City would go through, especially the second leg being Etihad. had them. When De Bruyne equalised, I thought that was it. I thought they were going, going on to get their second. But you just see Real Madrid operate in the latter stage of the Champions League, and I don't like to lean too much on the on the heritage thing, but it is a thing. They believed they were going to go through no matter the circumstance. And you see they've got Carlo Ancelotti in the dugout. Somebody tweeted he's the kind of manager that believes the economy will just correct itself. <laughs> he just sits there, he's very laser <laughs> fair, and he lets things un un play and, or, um, unfold. And he's such a good manager in terms of letting superstars come to the fore. I think the Real Madrid is a different interest than Real Madrid. They're not a complete team. They're a team that still have gaps, the team that still need to improve in certain areas. But when you've got the quality of players, like a Drew Bellingham, who was probably their best player on the night, but didn't necessarily do what we expect him to do, you've always got a chance. And they just frustrated City. They defended resolutely. It was a completely different game plan to what we've seen Real Madrid put forth in the Champions League before. But they've got the job done and they're in another Champions League semi-final. Who deserves to go through more, do you reckon, Harry? I know we, when it gets to penalties, it is that, that cliche, but it is a lottery. Did Real deserve to go through based on the 100... 20 or minutes we saw from them? Uh, no. Or did you feel it was pretty even? I felt that City probably edged it in terms of the overall game. Um, I didn't watch the game in full last night. Obviously, I was watching the other one. I, I did catch the highlights and I saw all of extra time. 
it, it just became like a little bit frantic in extra time. I felt like Real Madrid were pinned back, but then there were points where they were like breaking with two or three players and Carl Walker was getting City out of trouble with his incredible recovery pace. I think Man City probably edged it and will be really disappointed that they didn't manage to, to get over the line. But as we keep saying, it's Real Madrid. It was so weird towards the end of extra time. It was just like a game of like five aside that had gone on too long. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's yeah. so accurate. <laughs> that is so accurate. It's like, you, so I can't, oh God, I'm so nagging. I can't be asked. Loads of middle-aged yeah. blokes just losing their legs. Last and goal wins, one of them. Yeah, yeah, one of them. Yeah. Do you know what? But we, we should really touch on, on G. Belly and Quake. You mentioned him there. That touch for the first goal is absolutely outrageous. And Stephen mm. Manaman completely did me because he said it was a bad touch so, but yeah. I completely missed the sarcasm oh, yeah. and Scott mentioned to me he was like mate it's completely sarcastic I was like how have you missed that but the point was wait was... did you come in going that's Steve McManaman man, for God's sake no, no, tweet no, it. no oh, but God. yeah I, I was the same though because he said it yes. I don't know if he was being sarcastic Honestly. man because he said it and then he completely backtracked when the replay came on and I was just like mm, you said it wasn't a great touch and, it, and, and the tone wasn't there I don't know it was a great touch though oh, and man. the way he just creates space for himself he does the basics so well Jude Bellingham he's such a he's such an interesting player to watch because it's not necessarily like when you see a Jamal Musiala you can really see that he's a technically brilliant footballer and I'm not saying Jude Bellingham's not but he just does the basics really well and gives himself so much time on the football pitch and if it wasn't for him in terms of his pressing in, in the in extra time Real Madrid would have lost that game and He's so imperative to what they do and the fact that it's his first season in Real Madrid is a testament to, to his mentality and his ability to take on the burden of being the best player of the biggest club the in the world. The way he took the penalty as well, it just summed them up. It's crazy. Yeah. I'll tell you what I'm fed up about though with, with Jude Bellingham is this like, after every interview he gives, it's like, oh, he's the kind of guy that you'd love your daughter to bring home. Can we just give yeah. that? Well, well, Rear <laughs> Ferdinand. Like, yeah, like, it's over and over. So this is a message to Rear Ferdinand. Time. It's like, we get it. He's a nice kid. Yeah. He's a great footballer and he's a nice kid. That's it. Yeah. Like, why do we have to keep re recycling that it's same just the, way, just the way he speaks, oh, the way he carries see. himself. He is only 20 years old, Harry. Is there anything wrong with that? No, there's nothing wrong with praising the guy, but it's that old cliche phrase of, oh, he's the kind of guy you'd love your daughter to bring home. It's like, all right, but mate. We've never I've had, had Jude Bellingham before, though. And what I mean by that is he's gone to Real Madrid super early. There's like, there's no change on his career. He's almost seemed to have the perfect career so far in terms of at Birmingham, going to Dortmund and going to Real Madrid. And I feel like there's so much fawning over him because he seems perfect. He, he looks perfect. The way he plays is perfect and he hasn't had a blemish on his career as of yet. And so I understand why people do love him and every time they hear him speak, they, they're excited because he's this kind of superstar that we've, we've been begging for, we've been asking for and now we've finally got it and he's performing at the highest level consistently. 100%. I mean, a huge role in that opener for Rodrigo. Got a little bit away with it as well because that first effort, I was like, have you not put that away? But put it away. And then it really, I think the one man that probably can keep his head out high from a rail point of view for two players, Lunin, firstly, I, I thought it was a huge performance from him yesterday. I think it almost went under the radar. The amount of times where you see that typical City cut back where they get to the bar and you need your keeper to come out, otherwise Haaland's got to tap in. And the other man at the back, Antonio Rudiger. In terms of world defenders at this moment in time, is there a better centre-back in world football than Antonio Rudiger? He's right up there at the minute. I can't think you of many better. On form right now, right here, Maybe Liverpool fans would argue Van Dijk, would they? But yeah. on can you argue one of yours? Uh, I'd say you can argue it in terms of the overall season, but Rudiger's turned in some yeah. big indiv like one-off performances. He just gets the better of Haaland like all, almost all the time. Yeah. Do you know what it is? You know? I found with Haaland, and it's not to discredit him because he's a fantastic striker, but when people give him a bit of this, mm. he loses his head. Yeah. He, he can't concentrate on the movement anymore. He can't concentrate on the game. And all the defenders that seem to get joy against Erling Haaland are those characters whereby they will push the boundary as far as they can to get under your skin and wind you up. Antonio Rudiger's full of that. Yeah. Great defender, but he's in your ear all the time. He's stepping on your toes. He's stepping on your heels. He's that kind of guy. And Erling Haaland, I think, struggles with that generally. You mentioned about Haaland losing his head potentially. One man he did lose his head post-match was, was Rodri, and we do have a clip about what he said post-match after the game last night. To be honest, today I saw only one team, uh, yeah, in terms of defending. They defend and they knew how to suffer, and yeah, of course, we know how, how tough is Real Madrid, uh, but in my opinion, we should go through. Scott, you've got a problem with Rodri. I'm sick and tired of this. Honestly, I'm sick and tired of football-style elitism, and Rodri is a prime candidate for it. Every time when Scotland beat Spain, he came out and said it. Like, I know that you play for Pep Guardiola, who is like the most football ideals kind of coach. Like, possession, you play a certain way, and Pep himself does this. So I understand why he can come out and 
believe that. But to put down other teams for playing football a different way, it's not on for me. It's just not on. He used to play for Diego Simeone. He used to, literally used to play for Diego Simeone. And now he can turn around and say, no, I play for Pep now. So all of a sudden, like, our football is just so much better than yours. Like, if everyone played like Man City, it would be boring. Football would be boring. Yeah. So he needs to get that in. Kwaku, Rodri. I mean, look, from my perspective, I see it two ways. On the one hand, I'm not expecting someone who's a serial winner in Rodri to come <sighs> off the pitch and be happy. Yeah. At the same time, there probably is a way in which you lose. And yeah. I feel like Rodri, every time he does lose, which isn't often, I think yeah. the last loss in football when he's played was that Spain-Scotland game. Yeah. I remember he made comments before when Leicester beat Manchester City about the way they played. Yeah. One team wanting to play football, another team not wanting to play football. Mm -hmm. How do you how what's your perspective on Rodri as a whole? You do you understand it or are you kinda of like a bit more class, mate? So Come last on. week he was tired. This week he doesn't like the style of football that Real Madrid are playing. Style of play is a privilege that's afforded us the best teams in the world. So I can understand an expectation that Real Madrid are gonna start playing a certain type of football when they come to the Etihad, but Ultimately, football's about winning and about getting results, and that's what Real Madrid did. And so, who Roger can complain and he can cry, but they're out, and Real Madrid in the semi final. So, really and truly, that's his opinion. He can have his opinion. We can have his, our opinion on his opinion, but his team went out, and his team have not been good enough on the night. And despite the fact that City probably deserved to go through, they didn't go through, and we've talked about it so many times Champions League is about moments about capitalising on moments and Real Madrid do that better than anybody else and maybe Man City can learn something from that because Man City won the Champions League last year at a canter really they destroyed everybody including Real Madrid on their way to picking up the trophy for the first time in their history but ordinarily when teams win Champions League it's about capitalising on moments think about Real Madrid a few years ago where they won that incredible run against PSG against, against Man City as well um, and so Roger can cry, cry, <laughs> cry himself to sleep, man, because he's not in the quarterfinal or not in the semi-final Champions League, and Real Madrid are. And one of those moments that that Quake you mentioned was Kevin De Bruyne with a with a really, really lovely finish. Actually, one of those tough ones. I mean, not that I've been there on a Sunday, but you kind of stretching for it a little bit. You put it into the roof of the net, and you're wheeling away. Big moment. But I guess we do have to talk about the penalty situation. Now, as Harry said, it was a really, really tight one to call. Um, as soon as it does go to penalties, it is a little bit of a lottery. Lunin stood tall. I wanted to touch on the Bernardo Silva penalty mm. because the one bit that I think everyone's missing, despite it being a terrible penalty, some people would argue, okay, keeper goes down, it looks great, etc., etc. I've never been a fan of one of those where you roll it down the middle. I think if you're going to go down the middle, <laughs> lace it. But City fans keeping the ball in the stands and making him wait five minutes or so. Well, it wasn't five minutes. But the point was, it was a long period of time where he stood on the penalty spot waiting for the ball to come, which he missed, which added more pressure to the penalty. Is there anything in that, Harry? Do you think, think from a City point of view? I think, view? if I'm not mistaken, didn't Luka Modric smash the ball into yeah. the stands? Yeah, when, when Modric missed, he kicked the ball into the yeah, stands. So, but the City fans didn't give it back straight no, away. No, agreed. But I think it's one of those situations where it just happened and everybody's trying to attribute credit for that to mm. either it was clever from Modric or it was the Man City fans at fault. It just the ball just got smashed into the stands. Rule and it check. Happens. Can you get booked for that, even if, even if it's a penalty shootout? I don't know. I'm not too sure. I, I don't mean, know. Probably... Probably it would be really petty of a referee. In yeah. 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 We've had a super chat from Oscar. Uh, thanks so much. Mate. Good to see you. Chelsea won Champions League with Havertz as his, at his worst with Werner. Arsenal couldn't make semis with Havertz at his best with world-class Saka. Uh, Obsessed. Let's, let, we'll, we'll touch on Arsenal in just a moment. Um, but Lunin, I wanted to touch on Lunin because he, I have to say, I, when it went to penalties, I did back him. I didn't realise how much he fills the goal as well. Like I yeah. think when you compare him to Edison's never been fantastic at penalties. His penalty was great though, the yeah, one that he took. But the one he took. Like what has that always been a thing with Pep with Edison? I don't like to put him on the final penalty. He's like quite a big Yeah. He's, he's pushed himself multiple times though, as like yeah. I could play in midfield, doesn't yeah, yeah. he? Like Do you he, actually he buy that? He really though? backs himself in terms of his ability. Do you buy so, that? So I don't know. In terms of taking a penalty, Pep's yeah. uh, pushed your idea a little bit a couple of seasons ago. If you remember when City was struggling for penalties and Mahrez was missing and KDB was missing and Sterling was missing, he was like, I might have to go down to Edison. And Edison stepped up and he put it away nicely and credit to him. Because like you say, when it comes to penalty shootouts, he's not necessarily the best in terms of saving penalties, um, but he put his penalty away and his teammates couldn't back him up. And on that Bernardo Silva penalty, it's just so interesting to see a keeper keep their bottle and stay down the middle because normally you, you, the, the player gives it the eyes and the keeper dives but the fact that Lunan stayed there and he saved it and his story as well in terms of signing as the third keeper obviously they brought in Kepa on loan um, Couture has been out of an ACL injury and the fact that Lunan is now the keeper for Real Madrid in the Champions League semi-final it's testament to his dedication testament to the fact that if you stick at it you are going to be given opportunities it's about taking those opportunities and last night he took that huge 
We have to talk about Carlo as well. Getting one over Pep, but also Scott. What Jude said in his post-match comments about Ancelotti basically just letting the Real Madrid players play, and I think that's one thing you say about the big teams. If you can make, there's no doubt about the talent in all these teams in the Champions League, but making sure that they can play at their peak performance. Mm. What did you make of those comments from Jude on, on Ancelotti? I thought they were quite nice. I mean, I don't know how long Ancelotti's got left at club level. I mean, there's been chat that he would leave Madrid like end of this season, but I think he'll stay. There was chat he would go to Brazil as well, mm-hmm. wasn't there? Yeah. So like, and that's, a, that's obviously international management, which is typically like end of career kind of vibe. But the way that he's got over the line so many times with so many different top clubs <coughs> proves that in the age of football style elitism that I just talked about that the old guard can still survive and if you can find a way to let your players express themselves and you know sometimes it's, it's going to take different forms isn't it sometimes they'll overpower you sometimes they'll outplay you sometimes they'll sit back in soak up pressure and beat you on the counter attack sometimes they'll just dig in and that's that's necessary mm-hmm. uh, I, I really respect managers that can do that um rather than having just one ideal way of playing, that if it doesn't work, you lose. I think Carlo Ancelotti's a rare breed in that he is that guy, as you say, that lets people go and play the game the way they want to play it. And he's really confident in the player's ability to manage the game themselves, to figure out the details as they're going, rather than having such a structured plan. But you can only do that when you've got a team of superstars. You can only do that when you're a Real Madrid manager or an AC Milan manager once you rock up at somewhere like Everton, which you did, you can't do that because you don't have that quality of player. You can't possibly have that same belief in those players. And can we just take a second to remember? <laughs> I completely that? forgot yeah, about yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, <laughs> Ancelotti managing Decore, James, James Rodriguez. James. Remember doing? people like after Charles after Charles four games, James Rodriguez was being hailed as like the best player in the world. <laughs> well, do, do you remember also <laughs> after like midway through that season, people were saying that Calvert Lewin, they're comparing him to Inzaghi. They're like, oh my god, look what Ancelotti's doing to Calvert Lewin. It was it was mental that year, and the fact that Carlo Ancelotti's done it for so long um, is. I don't know. He's one of the greatest managers of all time. And I also feel like with Carlo, he also relies on the old guard. So that performance, they wouldn't have been able to pull that out without Nacho, without Carvalho, Sorry. without Tony Cruz. And then you have the youngsters with the legs to pull it off as well. They have to have that blend around Madrid and they've had that under Carlo Ancelotti. And that's why they've seen so much success. And I know that people feel, feel like the end is near for Carlo, but... I don't know. In the Champions League, where it's reliant on moments, he's manager that consistently gives you moments. He's really, just got he's sorry. just got to pick his jobs really carefully. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's that's all it is with yeah. Carlo Ancelotti. Like if he can manage any of the big big clubs, elite clubs. The minute you drop down a level, then there is more instruction required. There is more analysis required, and then maybe some of the more modern coaches come into their own. Yeah. But Carlo Ancelotti, look at his record. Yeah. He's knocked Pep out of the Champions League more than anybody else, I think. Yeah, really. Um, which is an achievement in itself. And uh, there was a great comment from Hillier saying, Ancelotti is the most decorated manager in UEFA Champions League history, having won the trophy a record four times as a coach. And also the point on Quaker about individuals. I think it goes under the radar. Carver Howe's performance yesterday yeah. on a yellow card. That, as you mentioned, someone who's in the latter stages of his career to put in a performance like that for the whole, I couldn't believe that on a yellow as well. Well, when Doku came on, I was like, oh, Carver Howe's in trouble. Yeah. And then he just, he just kept him under wraps. It was a great performance from him. I want to ask you though, Scott, if Ancelotti, I know that you want to keep Ten Hag, if Ancelotti was available uh, in the summer. I'm not defending him anymore. <laughs> <laughs> he's not defending him anymore, but he still won't say he wants him sacked. <laughs> Would you say Ancelotti or uh, Old Trafford? I was just thinking that. Like, in terms of the vibe that United have wanted for the last decade of, oh, let's buy some superstars and let's get them to do whatever and let's, let's win games. It might have been a really good fit for United. We've just been team. saying that Carlo Ancelotti needs an elite job and then you thought Man United <laughs> for the equation. Come right. on. Bigger we- club than you'll ever be, mate. <laughs> oh! Where, where were you last night? <laughs> Here we are. Here. This is why I came today. This is why I came today. The Twitter chat continues. Oh, my god. Just, uh, just one more thing on Real Madrid before we go? Go on. Um, or before we move on. No, no, absolutely. Like, look at this team now and how Real Madrid have regenerated that team. Mm. They've done the... Maybe the centre-backs need... Maybe they need to sign a centre-back. They, they've been linked with a few. They've done their midfield. They've got some really good attackers. The, the wing-backs or the, the full-backs and they, maybe they need upgrading. Carver Hall and, you know, the left side... Alfonso, Alfonso Davis, Davis yeah. Trent's been linked, yeah. Hakimi. If they get some of those players, especially on like free transfers in the next year or two, and then you had Endrick and Mbappe. Yeah. Well, the last bad sign they made was Eden Hazard in 2019. Yeah. Ever since then, they've sold well and they've bought well. 
Um, and that's why they're in the position to bring in these best players. Obviously, they're around you, they generate incredible income, but they can sign the best players in the world because over the last four or five years, you can criticise Fiorentino Perez for all the Super League stuff, but in terms of running Real Madrid in comparison to Barcelona, they've been the world-run club and that's why yeah. they're in the position they're in right yeah, now. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And one player just finally, Valverde as well. I so love the middle was... I absolutely love what him. What is it about Valverde that you love, Scott? Because I just think he's, he's got everything, he's got everything every, in his game. Absolutely yeah. everything. And he's like deceptively really fast. His, his control's really good. Uh, he can pass the ball. He just does not stop running. Yeah. Does not stop running. I think he's like the perfect example of a modern midfielder. Like, I, I think he's brilliant. He is top. So it will be a uh, Bayern Real semi final. We will touch on Bayern. Make sure to leave a like on the stream, subscribe to 90 Min, all that good stuff. Mm. Bayern won Arsenal nil on the night. Bayern go through 3 2 on aggregate. Harry. Um, I'm going to kick it off though with a, with a social post from, from Arsenal's club channels. Uh, at full time, they tweeted a Champions League journey to be proud of. Beating Sevilla, beating Lon, beating PSV, scraping past Porto on penalties, went out to the worst Bayern side we've seen in a long time. Is it a Champions League journey to be proud of, Harry? It's <laughs> <laughs> so mean. Right, this is, this, this is how the Twitter beef started, right? Because Scott posted something saying, that caption sums up Arsenal's mentality as a football club. You work in publishing, yeah? You have done for so many years. What did you expect Arsenal Football Club's official account to come out and put? Oh, God, guys, that was rubbish in the second half. We deserve to be out. Is that what you were expecting? No, I, to I literally replied is... to you. Did you read my reply? Yeah. I said, we're out of the Champions League or uh, elimination from the Champions League in Munich, full stop. That, that's what I would have posted. Yeah, that's what you would have posted. But like, it, th there's Are you no... proud, though? Are you proud? Am I proud of... The run. Well, the thing is, you can talk about the run all you like. The r run is the run that you're given. You can't dictate that run. You can't hold it against Arsenal that they were put in that group and that mm. they faced Porto in the round of 16. Y you just can't. And you sat there in the build-up to this game and said, don't sleep on Bayern. Bayern could do Arsenal. And now it's a disgrace that Arsenal went out to I Bayern? I didn't say it was a disgrace. Well, Did not then, say it was but a you're, disgrace. you're digging out the run that Arsenal I, went on. I said, right, as Jakey just said, this is the worst Bayern team in 11 years. I thought European experience would come into this. And I was right. Because Bayern have it. Arsenal don't. But most people went into this game saying Arsenal were favourites. Most people did. Right? And they couldn't get the job done. Like, you haven't, you've won an FA Cup under Mikel Arteta. One. Right? Yeah. Are you going to win the league this year? I don't know. I think the journey that Arsenal are on is fantastic. I think the, the job that Arteta has done is fantastic. But some point has to come, we get the job done. And every year in April, we reach this point. Okay, but what I will say is that like, it's the, it's the nuance, it was the minutia of like, should they have tweeted that? Should they have just tweeted heartbreaking loss and be done with it? But really and truly, there are 20 year old Arsenal fans that have never seen Arsenal win the Premier League. And so this is a new Arsenal. This is a, this is a different Arsenal. And I know that we're, we're talking about the reputation of Arsenal that have won multiple league titles and they were challenging for titles consistently. But this is a, a different Arsenal team so I can understand why there are some Arsenal fans that are proud of the team for getting this far because last time we saw Arsenal the Allianz they were losing 5-1 against Bayern Munich I know that Bayern Munich in a different place and Arsenal in a different place but I also feel like it's overstated Bayern Munich's demise they've got a lot of good players and I feel like if they brought in Palina in the summer mm. it would have been a very different season we're juxtaposing their season to, mm. to Leverkusen who are having an incredible season arguably the greatest season in Bundesliga history and so I do think this Bayern Munich team are a good team and I think that Arsenal if they had got that second goal in the first leg if Ben White puts that away it's a completely different game so I do understand where you're coming from, Scott, in terms of if you're a huge team, you're not tweeting. Real Madrid aren't tweeting that if they go out of the quarterfinals. Neither are How did, Bayern it wasn't, Munich. Like, it, but this, this is the thing. It's Real Madrid aren't tweeting it or this club ain't tweeting it. It's all a load of revisionist nonsense, right? Because nobody really looks at... Nobody's gone back and looked at what X club tweeted the when tweet they went out of the Champions 16 million League. views or something like yeah, that. Yeah, because like, it's from Arsenal's official accounts and Arsenal are a big football club. I'm not club. alone in what I'm thinking. Arsenal's official accounts are always going to be complimentary of the team. It's the way it works. It's the way football Twitter works. You find me an admin at any club in world football that would post something even remotely negative about their club. They won't because it's PR, it's business. That's how the game works. The problem here is not what Arsenal posted. It's the fact that you've gone looking for something like that well, to, to, to have a go at Arsenal. To have a go at Arsenal. But, but Harry, you know, you're, talking, you're talking about our run. Didn't United go out of a group that had Copenhagen yes, and Galatasaray? Yes, I will sit here every right. day and say United right. are crap. So from your position, 
where, where like, is it that like, just because oh, it's Arsenal's watched, mentality? Just because I like you, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on a minute, hold on a minute. <laughs> you have sat there all season and defended a mediocre manager in Eric Ten Hag, yeah. and you want to sit here and talk about mentality of clubs. Mm. Harry. He's the guy who's trying to change the mentality of the entire football. And how's Harry, that going? Harry, Harry, Harry. It goes back to the question at the start. Is that a Champions League journey that you are proud of as an Arsenal fan? Yeah. I'm fine with us getting to the quarterfinals in our first season back in the competition for years. For so many of those players, that's their first experience of Champions League football. Am I going to be singing from the rooftops and saying what an amazing run it was? No. But I'm not saying I'm not proud of the team and the progress that they've made. Again, they're in the title race, second consecutive year, and they went to the latter stages of the Champions League. They had a different thing to contend with along the way, and they've remained in the title race. It might be 5% progress, it might be 10% progress, but it's still progress. But let's be honest, Harry, this Champions League was open for Arsenal. Let's, let's yeah. make How? no mistake. How? It, this is nonsense, Jakey. Harry, 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 second Harry, 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 Harry. We, we let's, literally let's talked about how Arsenal were in people's minds Better than Real Madrid. No, that we wasn't did. what we Harry, said. Harry, Arsenal we said. were the favourites in this <laughs> tie. Wasn't what we said. Arsenal were the favourites in this tie. Let's mm. let's make no bones about it. The way, as Kwaku said, Bayern have been playing this season has not been to the level that we've seen from them before. I understand the argument that they've got nothing else to play for, sure. But let's if you look at both teams on paper, most people would have backed Arsenal to get through, regardless of the fact you haven't been in the Champions League for and a while. And most people backed Manchester City to get through, and they didn't. Okay, but right. the but that that that, that that's almost top, irrelevant. Because, top in because that's football. The point is, the draw was open for Arsenal to get to the semi-finals. That is a fact, Harry. You can't you you cannot you can't disagree with that. Surely. When the quarter-final and semi-final draw came out, we all sat here and discussed it, and I said to you that is the worst possible draw that Arsenal could have got to face Bayern Munich, who were going to lose the Bundesliga title way before that, but still have the pedigree, as you all keep telling me still have the quality, and then to face one of the two favourites for the competition in the semi if you make it through, and to have those fixtures in a title race. I said to you all, that was the worst possible draw we could have got. And now you're telling me, and you all agreed, and yeah. now you're telling me, oh, the draw opened up for Arsenal, and Arsenal should have gone <laughs> no, no, all the no, way. You're not saying go all the way. We're not saying go all the way. No, and it's what, what, shambles that they're what not I will the say, What I will say is it, this is all predicated on performance. Say last night was a fourth incredible game by me, it's good last minute, but you could admit yourself, second half you went out of a whimper. Agreed. And so when people, I'm not in this camp because I don't really care what Arsenal tweet. Arsenal can tweet what they want to tweet. But when people are looking at that tweet and saying proud, so what performance of the Champions League are you proud of? Like what, name me one performance that Arsenal had in the Champions League that you're proud of. But it's not talking about individual performances, is it? It's a, it's a generic post about the fact that but, Arsenal in their first season back in the competition have gone to the quarterfinals and narrowly lost to a side that everybody keeps saying. Well, was, there, but, but was, there, the was there one game that Arsenal, not even overperformed, just performed to the level they're supposed to? Like you, when well, they won their group. What yeah, more can they do? Can I say this though? Six. Right? There was a six-nil victory in the against. Uh, you also, it, but Jakey, can can I say this right? We're looking at a social media post saying proud, but that is representative of Arsenal's entire vibe, right? So I'm guessing that the like. Everything needs to be synergized. Everything needs to be pulled together. We've all seen that Arsenal documentary. We've all seen the Arsenal players being told by Mikel Arteta to go and, you know, G the crowd up. They do it all the time. We've seen the social media posts, the hype video. They, they dropped one yesterday, the hype video about, like, time to stand up. You didn't stand up. Okay. You didn't stand See, up. See, well, I disagree with you there, Scott. Is that, is that a bad thing? Is that a, a synergy? It unites them for sure. Synergy in the football but club, is that a, a bad step thing? Up, they, need to, they need to take a step above that. Well, they need is, to. This is the one They're one of the best teams in Europe. <laughs> they need to. We were going to say in the now, last show. Yeah, hold on, just, just, just to finish on that. Synergy at a football club is a bad thing. Togetherness at a football club is a bad thing. All singing from the same page is a bad thing, apparently. I'm saying yeah, that you're club, at a level yeah, Arsenal, that isn't uh, high enough Scott, for what your expectations yeah, Arsenal, should be. Uh, Arsenal are the club that are progressing. Yeah. And the club that clearly has none of that stuff no relationship with its fans currently. Players going on social media and liking posts, berating the manager. Another player going out and posting about how his manager's a liar. That's better? Is it better? I'm not sitting here saying <laughs> well, then, that United are better than Arsenal. I'm saying no Arsenal... I'm not saying where, where, saying well, I'm, I'm, saying you, I'm saying you've been critical of Manchester United and the way that they've done so many things. And now you're trying to flip that what Arsenal have done, which is the polar opposite, is also wrong. So... Where's I'm the saying solution? that you should be more ambitious than being proud of going out in the Champions League quarterfinals. Oh, so, so you're telling me that because that tweet Because Arsenal are a good team. That's because, what I'm saying. It's because, a compliment to you. Because that tweet went out, that that means that in the dressing room, on the plane back, 
that there was no disappointment, no frustration, no anger, no hurt among the players or the fans that made the journey or I, the fans that were watching. Can I ask, do you think Arteta's going nothing. in there and saying, nah, guys, you need to deliver? Or is, it, is he like, guys, great run, really proud of you. How do you know? I've seen the uh, documentary. Uh, uh, oh, we've no, all but, seen it. We've seen the messaging. Yo, we've seen everything. Drake, Drake had a great bar. He said, jealousy is love and hate at the same time. Honestly, <laughs> really, really and truly, with Arsenal, unless you're a City fan or maybe a Liverpool fan, every other team in this country, fan base, are slightly envious. It's, oh, look at that song, that like North London Forever. Oh, look at the unity. Look at that. We all wish our club was like that. North London we, Forever till you're losing 2-0 at Aston Villa. 2-0 against Aston Villa. Scott, Villa. would you not rather be in Arsenal's position right now than when Maynard? Of course I would. Of course I would. I'm saying Arsenal have been run so well over the last four or five years that the time was now for them to do better than going out in the Champions League final. On Harry's, That's all I'm on saying. Harry's point, it was their first year back in the Champions League. I agree, they should have beaten Bayern Munich. This is a Bayern Munich team that were there for the taking, but they didn't. But we've seen in the Champions League, City teams that are way better than this Arsenal team took time to get to the Champions League mm. in terms of getting to the promised land. And so I understand why Arsenal fans are defending their team being like, Proud is too much. <laughs> Proud is too much. But I can understand why Arsenal fans are like, this is progress and the next season we'll see where we go. I think these criticisms are fair to be levelled at Arsenal next year if this thing happens again. First year back in the Champions this League, I can understand year. it. I, I, I just I, find I, it astonishing. We've got that, super chat, so... I just find it astonishing that a group of people here, all sitting around this table, that all work in the business of football and publishing stuff, have taken that tweet so literally. Mate, we all know how it works. I literally we wrote five words on it. <laughs> we all know how it works. Yeah. We all know that the club is going to want to put a positive. Harry, Harry, what are they going to tweet? Harry, we're effing rubbish. Harry, no, Harry, Harry, let's I'm get saying it. tweet. We're out of the Champions League. Uh, Harry, let's flip That's this. That's it. Let's flip <laughs> That's all this. I'm saying. Let's Who flip cares? This. Tottenham Hotspur <laughs> tweeted the exact same thing after the result last night. You would be going yeah. in on them. Yeah. 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 Let's would. Yeah, yeah, Harry. Yeah, You'd be would. saying that's Spursy. Yeah. You, you would. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. absolutely yeah. would. If I if I was sitting at home on a Wednesday night watching Emmerdale when Tottenham were playing in the UEFA Champions League, I wouldn't say a word. We've had a couple of super chats, paper cups podcast. Scott only makes excuses for United. Can I just say this? Because I support United and because because United are awful doesn't mean that I can't look at other clubs mm. and talk about them. That's my bloody job. No, but if you, my job. Yeah, but if you came here and you said Arsenal lacked cutting edge in attack or Arsenal ran out of gas because Mikel Arteta has not rotated properly or... Um, not you know, everything's tactical. Or, it's about bottle. Or the Harry. mentality went. Or they didn't have it. They didn't have bottle in the game. I'd understand they didn't have it. it. But you're going after the I, poor kid that does the admin the person, I don't think the person who runs Arsenal social media and tweets that out has any effect on the mentality exactly. of the football club. I I'm not that, I saying I that. I, but you I am saying that everything it. together represents <laughs> Arsenal's mentality. It's about, oh, look how lovely we are. We're all together, yeah. you know? Who made yeah. the link? You made the link between the I'm not the only one. We've had a super chat from Ian. Ian's been waiting in the live chat. Oh, oh. Arsenal, one of the best teams in Europe, question mark. Are Arsenal serial bottle jobs who bottle the final hurdle? Stop this crap about we are proud. Decide whether you are the Arsenal or less than Newcastle is one of the super chats. The, the, the live chat's popping off. Let's get on to the game as well because we do need to talk about some of the key moments. Yeah. Uh, Joshua Kimmich's bullet head. Arsenal have to stop that cross, Harry. I don't think there's any bones about it. You have to stop the cross coming in. And we've talked about narrative, Scott. <laughs> about this game, a lot of narratives. Quaker, I don't know if you caught the show when we were doing the preview to this. Yeah. It was just narrative FC. Okay. It was narrative. If you had a shot every time it said narrative, you'd be on the floor. Yeah. Scott, did the narratives build up? The narrative the... was perfect. What really? what narrative was perfect in this one? <laughs> I'm sure Tottenham fans enjoyed it. I'm sure the Tottenham fans enjoyed it. I looked at Harry Kane and I thought, this is the time for Harry Kane to step up. He's not going to want to lose this game. You can see how driven he's going to be. He scores a penalty in the first leg. Relatively absent in the second leg, fair enough. But the way that Arsenal were looking at Eric Dyer and saying, it's Eric Dyer. We've got him. We should get these. Mm -hmm. We should beat these. They've got Eric Dyer at centre back. The way that he performed, I don't know if he got man of the match. Was it Kimmich or was uh, it him? Kimmich won man of the match. Eric Dyer was, Eric was, a lot Dyer was man fantastic. Of the match. And you can see in the Sky Sports interview that he did after, he was asked about how does that feel? He just said nice about 14 times. It, it, it was nice. Yeah. It was nice. Like, imagine. That, that's the reason why they made that move. And yet, you know, you've joined a club that has that kind of... Uh, you've taken a step up. You've joined that club that knows how to win. And that's the narrative I was talking about. Like, either Arsenal dump Tottenham... Or Tottenham greats... Or a Tottenham great and Eric Dyer out of the Champions League. Or the Tottenham contingent go and dump Arsenal I'm the really, I'm that's really, the narrative I'm genuinely really happy for Eric Dyer Quakey because mm -hmm. I think when he joined Bayern there was a lot of people who 
He got ridiculed, got, mate. He got, got ridiculed, ridiculed. He got a lot of criticism. And yeah, time will tell whether it's it's a great sign in the long run. But I think for him, his own morale, his own sort of personality, I think that's a really big win in his career. Because a lot of, and let's be honest, a lot of people have wrote him off. Yeah, people did write him off. It didn't surprise me though, because if you think about where Eric Dyer came from, he came from sport in Lisbon. So he's, he's used to playing True. abroad. And so taking that step is not as big as somebody else who's never played abroad taking that step. And Thomas Tuchel was a manager that saw him firsthand when Chelsea played against Spurs in the, in the Premier League. And he's found a way to integrate him. It seems like Bayern Munich have got 17 centre-backs. Like, please give me one of them. <laughs> like, they've got so many centre-backs. And last night was just a, a proper Tommy T performance. And I'm going to be completely honest, out of all the teams left in the Champions League, I want Bayern Munich to win it because, like I say, narrative, narrative, yeah. narrative. Thomas Tuchel's on his way out. Say they, they win the semi-final against... Real Madrid and they get to the final. They play maybe PSG, who's his former side, a Dortmund, who's a oh, former side. There's, there's so much narrative for, with Tommy T. And if he does win the Champions League, the, the world is oyster in terms of jobs available in world football. Um, but the job that he did at an Arsenal, an Arsenal team that are just better than Bayern Munich, has to be commended because... Everybody before this time, not everybody, but people said man for man, Arsenal should do this. And the fact that he's getting the best out of players like Eric Dyer, the fact that Harry Kane still got a chance to win his first ever trophy, I'm I'm happy for Bayern Munich. I feel like the narrative's with them in the Champions League. Can, can I just say this whole Kane narrative well. thing, right? Narratives are nice. They you make stories out of them and all of that. But these narratives that you guys are peddling out couldn't be further from what actually happened in this tie. Go on, talk to us then. Harry Explain Kane, what happened. Harry, Harry Kane scored from a, a, the penalty spot mm -hmm. and was largely anonymous over the two legs. Now, I'm not saying this with, with salt, as people like to put it. I'm not saying this with bitterness. Bayern Munich scored more goals than Arsenal in this tight and deserve to win. No problem. But this idea that it's... Big... Leon Goretzka was Bayern Munich's best player by a country mile across yeah. these two games. Eric Dyer wasn't outstanding defensively. He was lost. He was OK. No, he was OK. Arsenal he... didn't attack at all. Like, he was, uh, let's let's, get, let's give him credit where credit's due, no, Harry. Come no, no. on, okay. so it's no, Arsenal's no. fault for not delivering. No, 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 no. In the in the come big no, 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 no. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's Arsenal's fault for not delivering. Proud of it, yeah. And what I'm saying <laughs> is, is that it's very easy to go, like if Arsenal had gone and won that tie. It's like me turning up the next day if Bayern Munich's defense leaked three goals and going, "Oh, it's Harry Kane's fault," because okay. it's a, it's a nice narrative. Because he's an ex Tottenham player. So it's too easy. Let's talk about it's lazy. It's okay, then if we want to get away from that, so let's talk about what actually happened. If you can level the criticism of Harry Kane in terms of largely anonymous in the second leg, let's talk about Bukayo Saka. Agreed. Who is largely Agreed. anonymous for that? Because 100%. I feel like with Arsenal in that game, what you notice is they lack that superstar edge. Somebody to score a goal when things aren't necessarily going their way. Bukayo Saka is supposed to be that for Arsenal, and he wasn't that. We know Martin Odegaard was knackered. He was he was injured going into that game. He couldn't really perform to the best of his ability. But I want to shine a spotlight on Bukayo Saka, a player that I love. I love to watch him. I feel like he gets unfairly criticised. But in these big moments where we can sit here and criticise Erlen Haaland for not turning up, could criticise other top players. If Bukayo Saka wants to be in that category, he also has to get that criticism and last night he showed nothing 100% agree with you I'm not going to sit and, and defend a, a number of Arsenal individuals that were not good enough not at the right level I talked about it after the Villa game on the last show that we did it felt like at half time somebody had gone and switched the switch off on all of the players in terms of their fitness levels their energy levels they were gone and it was the same again yesterday and that's the big concern who's to blame the, for that the, Harry? probably the manager because he has not rotated perhaps enough now, you can make the counterpoint of if he did rotate more, would Arsenal still be in the title race or would they have dropped points where he tried to shake up the team a little bit? Maybe. There's an argument there as well. So I'm not saying, you know, you can go, yep, it's definitely because of that or definitely because of that. But the players have, have, have gassed out, man. Like that, That's the how, reality. How many, of it. how many players are Arsenal missing? In terms of like it, next season, for example, I, I, I still think there's a few spots you can 100%. Go. They, they, need a, they need a proper left back. They need to decide what they're doing at left back. I do believe that Jurian Timber would have played there a lot had he been available, yeah, but enough. obviously he's not. Um, they need to decide what they're doing in midfield because one of my big criticisms of Arteta in the last couple of games has been that you, you're going out chasing goals and there's this, there's this decision that he makes all the time. It's like, well, and Arsene Wenger used to do this a bit. I know what I'll do is I'll just throw as many attacking players onto the pitch as I possibly can and that'll get me a goal. If you've got no midfield, you've got no control. If you've got no midfield, you can't win the ball back. And all that ends up happening is the other team knock it across their back line. So was Thomas Partey the key player that didn't play? I, I, I can't get my head around why Thomas Partey wasn't for a while. involved in any capacity last night. I can't get my head around it. We've all been sitting there for months going, we need this guy back. We're desperate to have him back. He's been fit for ages. 
fit, I say, available in a squad. Surely by now you've got to be at the point where you can make an impact. Yeah. The best player for Arsenal last night, do you know who it was? It was Jorginho. Mm. Yeah. And he, and once he came off, all structure had gone. There was no ability to build up. There was nothing. And Saka was really poor. Odegaard looked half fit to me, so I'm going to give him a bit of a pass. Martinelli had nothing in terms of um, packing a punch. Havertz had nothing. Declan Rice looked like he was running through mud. Yeah. Like, there was a load of Arsenal players last night that were just not at the level. And that's why I say, not taking anything away from Bayern, that's why I'm saying the narratives about Dyer being outstanding. Well, he didn't have anything to defend against, really. And Harry Kane didn't produce anything. So it's easy that's to go throw those two. He didn't. I think, I think the no. narrative was, more, I think, to be honest, Harry, the narrative was more of two ex Tottenham players and one legend in Harry Kane go, being Arsenal in the Champions League. Don't you have to win something with a club to be a legend, though? Is that oh, well, don't well, do Harry, that. Harry, Harry, Harry. 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 I, I, I throw that right Harry. back yeah, at you, no, Harry. I'll tell you, I'll tell you well, what. Who, what. Who have well, I claimed? Well, well, Arsenal who have, like, five, who have I claimed that is an Arsenal legend that hasn't won anything? Uh, I don't know. Well, I think... I think well, that, well, I said, uh, when these players are built up... All I'm going to say is Harry Kane still has a chance to win a trophy this season. He does. What I do want to touch on this I've heard after this game after people talking about Arsenal's bench not being strong enough and I was going through Arsenal's bench I'm like Gabriel Jesus will start for a lot of clubs in the Premier League probably most clubs in the Premier League barring Man City and barring Liverpool Leandro Trossard who's been the best sub in world football yeah. um, Aaron Ramsdale who's a starting goalkeeper I know that you don't bring keepers off the bench you look down to Zinchenko who's a great left I think Arsenal got a great bench I think Arsenal got a great squad so what is it that's missing like you mentioned the players know. That, is it a striker well I think that's one of the obvious things that Arsenal need to address. And I've said all season that the next big significant signing they make will be that. We knew that. When we got into January, everyone was going, are oh, they going to go and sign this Aussie man? Whatever. They never had that money and nobody had that money this January. We know that. The next big signing will be a centre forward. But a month ago, we were talking about how good they are in attack. And now I'm going to turn around and say, oh, it's because we don't have a striker. I feel like I'd be a bit of a hypocrite if I went in too big on that. that that's a full storm, so, though. That those that from January up until now, I think you scored like something like forty percent of your goals in that period. Arsenal before that were struggling for goals. I think we've been talking about this for quite a while, and I feel like maybe we got fooled by Arsenal's form in the last three months in terms of them being a free scoring team. Defensively resolute, two of the best centre backs in in world football right now, and probably the best defensive partnership in world football. But going that's, forward, that's been what's an issue. abandoned them though. Yeah. The defensive resolve has gone. Yeah. And you can talk about them not creating much last night. Okay, away at Bayern, if you don't create a load of stuff, it's not exactly the end of the world. Um, and the Villa game, obviously, was a recent example. And that's why that problem about goals has become a bigger thing. The truth is, is that the defensive solidity has gone. That goal that Arsenal conceded, I saw some people online last night blaming David Raya. The cross comes in. David Raya, the, the no, initial cross. Do yeah. He does the exact right thing. He gets something on it and he sends the ball wide. Cross comes back in and Martinelli switches off. Yeah. I keep, and Kimmich runs past him. I keep saying this though, Jakey. You can score all the goals you want in January. You can win 6 0 five times in a row. You don't win when it matters. You don't win anything. Let's just touch on the poll in the live chat. Has this season been a progress for Arsenal? 59% of people in the live chat have said no. 40% of you said yes. Let's just wrap up this you, you can't section. You can't answer that now. With yeah, the question. You can't answer that now. You, you, Okay. If Arsenal win the league, it's let, let, let's let's frame it slightly differently then than how it has been in the live chat. If Arsenal don't come away with this season with the Premier League title, has this season been progress for Arsenal? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Come on, man, because there is a difference between competing in the Europa League and Premier League and competing in the Champions League and Premier League. Different pressures, different different strains on the body. I think so. I think so. Arsenal finished second surprisingly last season, and this season was like, can they sustain it? Was that just a uh, a flash was that just a full storm and this season they've shown that they are no they are one of the best teams in the country so for me that is progress because competing in those two competitions is very very difficult and Arsenal have not shown they can do that for the last like 15 years and the Let fact me, that they're where they're at right now is testament to the squad that Arteta's built one final thing I'll say right and, and I'm not comparing Mikel Arteta to Jurgen Klopp because Jurgen Klopp's done an amazing job and he's got loads of trophies to show for his time at Liverpool but when they were finishing second to Manchester City why was the narrative completely different? Why was it, look how brilliant a job Klopp is doing on a lesser budget and he's competing with Manchester City, yet when Arteta falls short and Arsenal falls short, it's their bottle jobs. Because you he took it to the, the very, very end. Like if Arsenal take it to the last day this season and win on the last day and do everything that they can, I think that argument falls down. Yeah. But if you drop out of the title race in April... Or if you go out of the Champions League in April... But they're not out of the title race yet. That's my point. No, I'm saying, but if you lose at Wolves this weekend and that continues and you lost at home to Aston Villa at the weekend, yeah. 
That's the that's the difference. That's fair. And also the difference between the the Liverpool situation, and the Arsenal situation, is that you look at the Liverpool team, you saw where they were a little bit incomplete. But as soon as they brought in those pieces, those final pieces, they in Allison and and Van Dijk, and the they, won, they won the Champions League and then they won the Premier League. Everybody expected that Declan Rice was going to be that final piece. And if you bring somebody in for 100 million, who's not a goal scorer, who hasn't got a tangible return in terms of the value, and you don't win the league, then you're like, okay, where do you go from there? And that's why I think there's a difference because last word on Liverpool yeah, won last, the Champions last, League and Last league. word on Arsenal. I just think that the, the, like, the standard is Manchester City and they are just leaps and bounds above everybody else. And the problem is, is that people will always go, well, Arteta spent 500. It's something like... People keep saying 700 million. I don't know where that figure's come from. It's nonsense. It's 500 and something million pounds that Arsenal spent during his time. And they keep going on about it. The truth is that Manchester City squad that you're expecting Arsenal to be on par with has cost 1.2 billion pounds to, to put together. And they have the best manager in world football. To fall short to them, I'm not saying it's something you should be proud of. And I'm not saying it's something you should dance and jump up and down about. But it isn't the disgrace or the bottling that people want to make it out to be. That's why Arsenal fans get defensive, because the context of what they are up against is completely lost in these conversations. There we have it. We've wrapped up the Champions League section. Thanks so much to everyone who's watching live at the moment. Please do give a like. Let us know what you think of Arsenal's season so far and also who you think will win the Champions League semi-finals. We go from Champions League to relegation. And this show is brought to you today. By Skybet, for the fans bringing you close to the game that we all love. Skybet's commitment shines through their long-standing sponsorship of the EFL, showing they're not just about bets, they're about enriching the fan experience, making our love for the game even richer. Remember, this is for 18 and above, so let's enjoy the game responsibly and head over to begambleaware.org for more information. Scott, I saw you laughing there. <laughs> no, sorry, just the, the live chat. The, the live chat's very good. And to be fair, we, we mentioned it in the last show about a YouGov poll, and we've got another one here today. So a recent YouGov poll, Quakey, Scott and Harry, said, and they asked fans to vote on which team would be relegated from the Premier League out of these three. So I think we can all agree that Sheffield United and Burnley are pretty much down and out. Yeah. Everton, Nottingham Forest or Luton. And we, if we look at the results, we can see that Luton were the favourites to go down leading with 54% of the votes, followed by Everton with 24% and Nottingham Forest with 22%. Guys, what do we make of those uh, results? So Luton are the favourites to go down according to the YouGov poll. Do we disagree with that? No, because if you look at the standard of the teams that have come up, Burnley and Sheffield United have gone down with a whimper or going down with a whimper. The thing about Luton, the X factor about Luton, that when they played against the top sides in this country, they've given them a great game, maybe haven't got the points that they deserve out of those games. But they're a side that can score goals. And if you can score goals, especially in the running, then you've got a chance. Whereas you look at the side like Everton, who are reeling off the back of a 6-0 loss against Chelsea, they can't score goals. Dominic Calvert-Lewin started scoring goals, then guess what happened? He got injured again. And so I fear for Everton. What they'll point to is that if we didn't have these point deductions, we would be firmly, not mid-table, but we'd be safe by now. Um, and so I worry for Everton the most. I know Luton are probably the favourites and should be the favourites. But if I'm looking at these teams that are down there, Everton are the ones that should be looking over their shoulder. But the thing about Everton is they've been here multiple times and somehow they managed to survive. So I can understand why Everton fans can lean on that. And also we do have to mention for context the points deduction for both Everton and Nottingham Forest as well. Scott, um, who do you have down as the third team to get relegated? I was trying to decide. It's really difficult. It's actually. tough. It's really but tight. At this time really of the tight. season as well, like, you know when it's the pressure's really on and then you start getting some funny results there are some teams that have secured mid-table or like something. A Fulham. Like a Fulham. <laughs> and I'll, I'll give you Luton's running. Brentford at home, very sort of. They're Actually, in that. They're in that. Yeah, uh, that corridor. Wolves away. Yeah. Everton at home. Yeah. West Ham away. Yeah. Fulham at home. Yeah. I can see them winning <laughs> three of those. Really, I, I really, I can see them winning three of those. Yeah, and I, I think I said it a week or two ago that I, I fancied Luton on the running just because of the the Kenny factor, you know, and yeah. the noise and oh, sorry, the Kenilworth Road yeah. factor. Uh, sorry, JK. No, he, no. Well, Rob Edwards has said about he wouldn't want Luton to stay up if it was based on a points deduction. But it looks like the only way they are going to stay up is if. Yeah. Well, Everton would be like 14th uh, on 35 points or whatever it is without it. The so. problem with the points deductions as well is that you wouldn't put it past the Premier League giving some of them back between now and the end of the <laughs> yeah, season yeah, yeah. because of like appeals and stuff. That's why this is this whole thing has been a mess. Who have you got down as the third team, Harry? I've got Luton uh, to go down. Mm. I just think they're going to fall a little bit short. I think. Nottingham Forest, I look at Forest and I think their squad is pretty strong in terms of some of the individual talents they've got. I think Nuno Espirito Santo knows how to get over the line in 
in this situation where he's required sometimes to just shut up shop. I think he's very good at that. His Wolves side, forget what happened at Tottenham, it was a short period, but his Wolves side were really organised and well drilled and I think that would be enough to see him through. Everton, I think they'll be fine and, and yeah. What if Forrest go to Goodson Park on Sunday and beat Everton? That is a massive game. That's a huge game. And that's the definition of a six-pointer because... Yeah. What do you think would happen? Maybe I'm still cast off for the Chelsea win um, on Monday, but and again, give Chelsea credit in that game. Everton looked so, so poor, had injuries in that game as well. Looks at like their right hand side, I'm like, Seamus Coleman is right back. Or, no, yeah, Seamus Coleman and, and Ashley Young. Young. I'm like, is it 2012? Like, that, <laughs> that can't run. And what they built themselves on is defensive solidity, and that went completely. And you heard Tarkovsky after the game talk about how embarrassing that was. And there's only so many times you can be struggling at the bottom of the table before eventually it catches up with you. Everton for the last two, three years perpetually have been struggling when it comes to April and May. And this might be the season they run out of luck. I can see Forrest going to Everton and getting something. Chris Wood's in great form. He's one of my favourite players. I don't know. Chris <laughs> Wood? Yeah, man. He's, he's, Let me tell you something. I've got to tell you something. I've got to tell you something. I've got to tell you something. Got to tell you something. Kwaku has had Chris Wood in his DMs. Yeah, uh, yeah Chris Wood. Um, mate, he's... So, what for your takes? No, just because I did this feature when I was working elsewhere. It was called Wood Watch. And I, when Chris Wood... <laughs> <laughs> And when, he, me. when he was at Burnley, he was a banker for at least tw 10 to 12 goals every single yeah. season. So when he made the move to Newcastle, I was like, he's going to give you that. He's going to give you about 10 to 12 goals. And he proceeded to score, I think it was nine goals over the next three seasons. And so we had this feature where we were just keeping an eye on Chris Wood. Every time we play a game, we'd see if he scored. And as soon as we finished the feature, he started banging in goals. And this season has been, it's been testament to how, how consistent or how much he stayed the course because it would have been easy for Chris Wood to, to kind of fall in by the wayside. You see him playing straight in the championship next season because things hadn't gone right for him. The move to, the move to Newcastle was a disaster, really. And at Forest, the one year was ahead of him in pecking order. One year goes down with an injury, Chris Wood starts scoring goals. And when you've got a striker who's scoring goals at this point in the season, you've got a chance. Um, and that's why I think Everton are going to struggle. I think that Nottingham Forest could go and get at least a draw at Goodson Park and then it sets things up perfectly for the end of the season. I think I'm going to go with Luton. I think, as you say, I think, and obviously, uh, yeah, I'm, they are my rivals with Watford, but you have to take a step back and go, the job Rob Edwards has done is to give them a chance of being in that sort of mix towards the end of the season. It's a brilliant be, job. I thought they'd be the bottom of the pile going into the season and they're the only one of the promoted sides that have even given it a go. And this is not a disservice to Rob Edwards, but I think sort of tactically and the experience he has and you compare it to other managers in the league, like a Nuno, He's not on that level, but what he does have is the charisma and the personality to bring everyone together, which yeah. is such an underrated part in a relegation battle. So just to wrap up, we agree with the poll that we think Luton are going to be the final Forrest. team. You've gone Forest. I've gone Luton. I'm going to go Everton, man. Oh. I'm going to go Everton. Oh. Go Everton. It's, it's close, though. It's really close. I'm looking at the run-ins now. Think, crazy things are going to happen, but all of these teams, I think, could win, can take some big wins. Big so... Wins. You know, Let us know who you think will uh, go down in the in the comment section below. Once again, a big thanks to Skybet uh, brought to you with today's show. For the fans, bringing you close to the game that we all love, Skybet's commitment shines through their long-standing sponsorship of the EFL show. And they're not just about bets. They're about enhancing the fan experience, making our love for the game even richer. Remember, again, this is for 18 overs. So let's enjoy the game responsibly and head over to BeGambleAware.org for more information. Scott, we missed a lot of super chats. Yeah, we missed loads of them, um, and that is completely um, my bad. But there is one from a GCFC just on the just on the top of my picture. Arsenal has consistently consistently bottled top four, Europa League, EPL, Champions League. If there was any other team, Harry would have gone in on them. Forget the past, but if you as a fan are saying you're proud of that particular run, it proves everything that Scott says is right. Here to make memories. Did I say I was proud of that run? You you back the Arsenal admin no, for putting I said that post it, up. I said there was no like. What so you you're telling me that like? the Arsenal admin are not in touch with the fan base? No, you're putting words in. My I'm going to save you there, Harry. Uh, <laughs> the ghost goes box with the no, super no, chat. No, I'll answer it. I'll answer it. No, no, no. <laughs> I don't need saving. Interception. I've spotted. Uh, yeah, he's coming in with a slide tackle. No, I, <laughs> I'm saying I'm saying that to to make the link between what a social media account posts. And the mentality of a football team, I think, is it's naive to think that everyone came away from the Allianz Arena last night and got on the bus after the game and went, don't worry, guys, Champions League run to be proud of and that they weren't gutted. Mm. We've got a super chat from the Ghost Knows Boxing. 
Difference is with Liverpool, they got around 95 points and lost by one point. Arsenal got 81 and will get low 80s this year. Also went to the Champions League final three times in six years. Uh, we've just to, should we box them in together? Go, you well, go I've first. Don, Donny LFC them. says Klopp got Liverpool to the final on first return to the Champions League. If I was Arsenal fans, I would be worried about their fight in the second half. There was also we also have AAK Harry. Uh, Harry's getting a lot of heat today. Bring it on! Thanks for your super <laughs> chats. Yeah, I really do appreciate stuff. it. By the way, really, really do appreciate it. Klopp got uh, Liverpool back to the Champions League and Europa League final in the first. Uh, yeah, Champions League final in his second, won the Champions League in his third, won the Premier League in his fourth, and Champions League final in his sixth. That's why it's different, but Harry. I did say that I wasn't comparing Jurgen Klopp to Mikel Arteta. I literally said that. I just said that the narrative when Liverpool fell short to Man City in comparison to when Arsenal were doing it is completely different. That's Harry, it. Harry, you're... Never said Arteta's as good as Klopp. Never said anything of that sort. Got any Harry, more, Scott? Your, your comment on Ram Prasad's comment. London is blue until Arsenal wins the Champions League. I think I th- we caught up with Ben. Have we caught up with most of the, most of the super chats. Is there any more that we missed, Scott? Yeah, no, just one last one about Scott. Actually, someone said his beard and hairline was strong. Yeah. Basically, yeah. Scott Samin. <laughs> thank you very much. Mate, I'll tell you what. Look at those jeans. Hope you're still um, watching. Thank, thank you very much. Let's wrap up today's show. It's been very a gracious. really action-packed one. Thanks so much to everyone who's watching today. Let's touch on the FA Cup this weekend, Quaku. It's, uh, mm. it's Chelsea versus Manchester City, the Cole Palmer derby. Um, we did a keep cell bench yesterday, and we had Palmer Foden Saka, which yeah. is which the lowest brilliant. hanging fruit. Yeah. Ever there is. Can I ask Harry a question? Are you feeling the celebration now? He's seen, he's seen, it, seen it twenty times this season, man. He scored well, as many goals as Erling Haaland. Well, he, yeah, was it you that said he didn't like the celebration the other day? Who said it? No, I, I, do you know what I just said? You? I, I've, I've always been in that camp. So. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, no, listen. Cole Palmer is an unreal talent. Yeah. I, I, I still don't like his celebration, yeah. but he's a fantastic player. Yeah. He deserves all the flowers he's getting. He's Chelsea's best player by a country mile, and I can't believe that somebody as astute as Pep Guardiola didn't put up more of a fight to keep a hold of him See, I, I can't believe I understand it I understand it, it. I understand yeah it. I understand it sometimes it's a natural thing can I ask Quaker a question absolutely would Scott. Cole Palmer have missed a penalty for Man City last night Cold by name, cold by nature he's putting that away man he's putting that away and I feel like that's why he's on the plane because when you go to a major tournament you know you're going to need moments of, of when somebody can put a penalty away and I think yeah. Cole Palmer can do that but in terms of the Cole Palmer derby in the FA Cup where can Chelsea get at City do you think because you've actually probably been one of the teams this season that have caused City some, some problems you know where we've actually caused them the most problems and it's where people don't normally attack City it's on their right hand side Raheem Sterling's turned Cole Walker in and out multiple times this season I don't think he starts on the weekend but for some reason we have joy when we attack down our left and City's right so I'm heading to the game I'm not going to say I'm confident facing Man City but they will be reeling off the back of going out the of the Champions League and we've got we've had good results against them this season that four all draw where Cole Palmer scored that last minute equaliser from the penalty spot uh, the draw at their place as well and we played Man City close we played them in, a, in an FA Cup semi-final a few years ago beat them there beat them in the Champions League final a few years ago as well so when we play against City I'm not as nervous as when we play against a Liverpool or even the United which is weird to say at this point you never time. know what you're going to get yeah, that, yeah. I, I want that to be the FA Cup final. Yeah, but I know that I, I, I bet you that if Chelsea beat Man City in the semi-final of the champ, uh, semi-final of the FA Cup we'll lose against Manchester United in the final it's just written for another loss in the, in the FA Cup final right. yeah it, it, it will be crazy but I, in terms of Cole Palmer as well just to speak on him like he deserves a lot of credit because there's a lot of players who could stay at City and be happy with limited minutes, but he pushed for a move. He went to Chelsea side where things were up in the air. Things weren't guaranteed. It's a project that Bowley spent billions, Chelsea have gone backwards, but at this moment in time, he's the one jewel in the crown that we can actually hang our hat on. And as a Chelsea fan, we're at this moment in time where we've never had it before. We've never had a player that is so good, but we're worried in the season or two's time other teams can come and take him off from us because we've signed so badly over the last few years. So with Cole Palmer, he deserves a lot of credit. 20 Premier League goals, same amount of goals as Erlen Haaland, and I expect him to bag on the weekend against the former side. To, to be fair to Cole Palmer, to like uh, to to leave what you had at City to go and play for a mid-table side is, you know, it, it talks about his desire to play regular it. football. Stop it. Stop it really does. Harry, 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 Harry. We, t- we, take, we take a step back, right? And you look at Cole Palmer and what, what he what did What have City. I said that was wrong? What have I said well, that was factually that, incorrect? That, well, you, it, doesn't, it, doesn't matter, it doesn't matter where Chelsea are in the league. The fact of the matter is, if you hadn't made that move, we wouldn't be talking about Cole Palmer, no, would we? I said, being he on the, said it says a lot about him that he was willing to go and play mid-table But he did, when he joined, he didn't expect them to be mid-table, did he? I'll still play Chelsea next week. Yeah. Someone get that, Do you fancy... Chelsea to I, I think the thing that's in a bit of an Chelsea's upset. advantage is obviously they played on Monday 
Mm. But City, you saw at the end of the City game yesterday, there were a few players that I'm sure Pep Guardiola, had they been able, would have wanted to keep on the pitch that he had to take off. And the turnaround time is really short. And, you know, that is something that should work in Chelsea's advantage. Yeah, It's, it's time, sorry, time for Erlen Haaland to stand up and deliver. Obviously not for me as a Chelsea fan. We saw him in uh, FA Cup semi-final last year against Sheffield United, didn't score. Champions League semi-finals against Real Madrid, both legs didn't score. Didn't score in either of those finals and, as again. I feel that if Erlen Haaland wants to be considered one of the best strikers in the world, one of the best strikers of a generation, in these big games, he has to turn up. And there was questions asked. He got substituted last night against Real Madrid when Man City needed a goal. And so Erlen Haaland, for his reputation, for his PR, needs to get on the score sheet against Chelsea. That's one of the semi-finals. Scott, the other one, Manchester United versus Coventry. And it's, uh, I, I'm a re- to be honest, Scott, I really hope Coventry do it. Because... Oh, I, like anybody who doesn't support Man United wants Coventry, What's Coventry to do it. I completely get that. Mark, Mark Robbins, obviously, that, that fact that he used to play for United, a United legend. You then look at some of Coventry's players this season. Hadji Wright's been brilliant for them. Callum O'Hare's fantastic as well. They've got some really good individual players. And obviously, they probably Sims. had the tie. Yeah, uh, Sims as well for, for Coventry as well. That tie at Wolves probably is the tie of the tie of the FA Cup so far, I think, in terms of drama yeah. as well. A huge, huge win at Molyneux. But can we see anything other than a Manchester United win? Because I'll be honest... I wouldn't be surprised there was an upset, Scott. This could be, I said it the other day, it could be one of the biggest upsets in FA Cup history. And then you said United aren't very good, so it's not that big an upset, actually. Uh, If United continue playing the way that they're playing and give as many shots away as they're continuing to do in every single match, there's a chance they could lose. There is a chance they could lose. They should not be losing. There is no world in which they should be losing. Uh, but magic of the cup, blah, blah, blah. Is this the last, 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 last chance for Eric Ten Hag? Will you say he needs to be sacked if Man United get I, th- I think, yeah, I'll come out and say it. So if <laughs> Manchester United lose to Coventry in the semi-final, you will say on camera. I think camera, that will be the final on, At 90 Min ball. Studios, yeah. Eric Ten Hag should leave. I, I, I have no choice. Okay, the the irony is it, though. Trapped in <laughs> because Mark Robbins was, he's lauded as the man who scored the goal to save Alex mm. Ferguson's yes. career at Manchester yeah. United. And it would be it would be so ironic if he's the man yeah. to lead the team to put a final nail on the coffin of Eric Ten Hag's career at Manchester United. Because I agree with you, if you don't win this competition, I think Ten Hag probably goes in the summer. Predictions? I, he could anyway, even if yeah. he does win it. Predictions for, let's do United Coventry. Who wins? Score. I can't predict Coventry will win. I think United will win. Yeah, United should win and comfortably. United win. I'm going commentary. And then uh, Chelsea uh, City. Chelsea 2 1 after extra time. Mm. Oof, I'm going to go City. Just I think it's almost the worst time to play them after the defeat. I'm gonna Especially go that big. City on penalties. <sighs> By the way, it's more hope with commentary. I expect United to win, but I hope commentary win. Chelsea. I think they'll do it. <laughs> Chelsea I think United this is final. the time. Is right? the, there's the argument of like, is this a good time to play City or is it a bad time? I think it's a bad time. I think Chelsea given what I've seen against them, against City this season, can do it. And part of me, I know people want to see Coventry in the final, but part of me really wants to see the Chaos Cup final. Like, mm-hmm. the, the two United-Chelsea games this season have been absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. And I think that as an FA Cup final would be really entertaining. Let's, the last thing we're going to wrap on with today, before we went live, we just saw a bit of news that FA Cup replays have been scrapped from the first round onwards. And I think we all turn to each other going, this is a this is not a good thing for the FA Cup, especially for a competition which, and a lot of people talk about it being the competition they watch growing up. But I know for you, Harry, someone who did that a lot, are you, what's your take on it being scrapped from, from the first round onwards? I don't like messing around with the FA Cup. For me, I've always been in the camp of, if you have to mess around with the Cups, mess around with the other one. Mm. Um, the mess Carabao. around with the EFL Cup. Right, okay. Make it that none of the sides participating in Europe play in it or something that kind of eases the the fixture schedule. Remember the FA Cup in the early rounds especially has its own dedicated weekends. Mm -hmm. So we're not talking about overloading players with midweek fixtures, whereas in the Carabao EFL Cup, that's what we're doing. I understand why they've done it. I guess the the flip side to that argument is that if you know a game's going to go to extra time and penalties, maybe there's a bit more drama. But that's been done off the back of a deal being agreed with the Premier League. And I don't know the details of, but I can only assume that the Premier League have agreed to put some money in the FA's coffers to help support the money that maybe some of those clubs would lose from not having another fixture. But yeah, I, I mean, I don't agree with this personally. Because I, I mean, just just to wrap up, I just you know, as a team in supporting a team in the Championship, I and even when we weren't doing particularly well, you would always look out for a replay. For example, we had Chelsea at home in like 2008, mm-hmm. 
and I was, we were literally playing for a replay to go to Stamford Bridge and get that day out. And you think about the money that brings to teams like, do you remember when Bradford beat uh, Chelsea at Stamford yeah. Bridge? Or I mean, that might be in the Carabao Cup, to be fair. But the point was they had the day out at a big stadium, at a big club, Scott, and that's now been taken away. I mean, Newport's a fantastic example, yeah. a team that hosted Manchester United at home. And what that brought to the table, probably the, one of the greatest nights in the club's history. And now that's not going to be a thing anymore. I mean, yeah, I, just, yeah. I think it's... A real shame. Yeah, it's a big shame. We need to find a way uh, to make sure that the clubs are compensated properly if they're going to make this decision. Um, but yeah, it does t- it does eliminate a little bit of the magic, doesn't it? A hundred percent. And also, like the fact that BBC has like sub licensed some of the broadcasting rights for TNT. The FA Cup should be on free to air TV all the time. And like you say, they're messing with the FA Cup, a competition that we all hold dearly to our hearts because we've all had magic moments in it. And it's not just about the big clubs. It's actually not about the big clubs at all. The FA Cup. It's about those clubs in the lower leagues or non-league to have a chance to compete against some of the top clubs in this country. And the fact that they've got rid of replays just it shows you what the higher ups in this country think about the FA Cup <laughs> do you know what we've just had a chat to uh, to wrap up that Nicky's behind in this video so he's now catching up with the uh, little bit of chat at the start <laughs> between you <laughs> and Scott yeah. so if you did enjoy today's video please do leave a like on the way out thanks so much to Quakey Scott Harry I really do really do appreciate um, you joining the show we had some great numbers some great comments less probably about Harry <laughs> it's fine absolutely keep them coming guys <laughs> top man take care of yourselves guys thanks so much for watching and we will see you in the next one cheers <laughs>